Hi, in this video we begin our study of thermochemistry. And so what we're going to start out by talking about is basics about energy, especially internal energy, and specifically the first law of thermodynamics. So of course we can't get into this without some definitions. First we've got energy. What is energy? It's the capacity to do work. But that definition makes you wonder what the heck is work. And so we define work as the result of a force that is acting over a distance. So very importantly, um, I know when my kids were sort of in the uh, snarky teenager phase, uh, we were supposed to be cleaning up the house and I'd say, what are you doing? And one of my kids said, uh, I'm holding down the couch. Now, is that work? Well, perhaps there is a force acting on the couch because someone is sitting on it, but it's not acting over a distance. The kid on the couch is not moving, so that's not work. What would be work? Um, lifting the couch, because then the couch would be changing position, so there's a distance involved with that force. All right, let's also talk about some energy units. The SI unit is the joule, and it's defined as one kilogram meter squared per second squared. Now, if you're wondering where that comes from, it comes from the equation for kinetic energy, where kinetic energy is mass times velocity squared. Another energy unit that is used is the calorie. Now, the calorie was the original metric unit. It was defined as the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water by one Kelvin. But because this is supposed to be a derived unit, that wasn't very useful. And so we default to the joule. So a calorie is 4.184 joules, and that is a number you will see quite a bit, especially in the next video. So you might look at that unit and say, hey, I know what a calorie is. That is the unit I use when I'm trying to lose weight. But that's actually not true. So if you look at the back of your food package, you'll see that it's calorie with a capital C, not a small c. And what we in America call calorie with a capital C is actually a kilocalorie everywhere else. So if you look at any sort of package of a food that's sold in both America and Europe, you'll see that it's calories and then parentheses kilocalories, kcal. So we Americans do everything differently and that may not be a good thing. You might wonder how many joules of energy are in a Snickers bar. Well, maybe you weren't wondering that, but it's sort of instructive. So if you're looking at a king size Snickers bar that has about 250 calories, and remember that those are capital C calories. Those, so it's what a scientist would call a kilocalorie. And so we have 250 kilocalories and there's a thousand calories in every kilocalorie and each calorie is 4.184 joules. So that tells us that there are over a million joules of energy in a Snickers bar. So I'm not just doing this for fun. I'm doing this to give you perspective of how small a joule of energy is. It's a really, really, really tiny unit of energy. And that's important for perspective because we're going to be doing a lot of energy calculations and you'll see that your answers are almost always going to be in kilojoules, sometimes megajoules as you see in this problem. And that is because the joule is a really, really small unit of energy. So there are a couple of ways we can divide energy up into types. The most common type is to talk about kinetic energy, which is basically the energy involved in moving something in some particular way. 
And because something is being moved, that means work is being done. Remember, work is the result of a force acting over distance. So potential energy is any other sort of energy, energy where no movement is being done. So how is that energy? Well, potential energy is work that can be done. And sort of the classic example of potential energy is a rock sitting on top of a cliff. So that rock is not moving anywhere, but it really doesn't take much impetus to get that rock to start moving. And you know that as soon as that rock starts moving, it's going to start moving off of the cliff and it's gonna fall a long way. And so the potential energy is gonna turn into movement. The potential energy is what exists by virtue of its position on top of the cliff. If the same boulder was down at the bottom of the cliff, it would not have potential energy. There would be nowhere for it to move. Okay, so temperature is something that we will hear a lot as well. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a substance. So at a cold temperature, things, even a solid has molecules moving within that substance. And as you start heating that up, the molecules start moving faster within the substance. So when we are just talking with our friends and we're talking about temperature, we often use that word interchangeably with heat, but heat is not a measure of the average kinetic energy of a particle. It's actually the amount of energy that's transferred between objects with differences in temperatures. So remember, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. So what this means is some of the kinetic energy of a molecule is going to be transferred to another molecule, which will make that molecule move faster. And it's kind of like um, playing pool where you can get the cue ball going at the start of the game and you, know, you have the cue ball moving, you have your other balls all racked up and they're just sitting there at the end of the table and when the cue ball hits them, then all the other balls suddenly start moving. So the, the energy for movement there is transferred from the cue ball. So now we come to something that I've sort of hinted at in the past, which is the law of conservation of energy. This tells us that energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. And so if you think about all the sorts of energy you might find in your house or around in your environment, you might think of things like an electric heater. Um, you might think of the light that's lighting your room. Um, you might think of chemical energy. Um, maybe not the way that I think of chemical energy, but you might think of something like, oh, I'm feeling a little worn out. I need to drink an energy drink you know, or eat some food, all of that would be a chemical form of energy. We can produce electric energy. So nuclear is one way, is what I'm showing here. Nuclear energy can be transformed into electrical energy, which can be used to produce heat, or which can be used to light a light bulb. So there's all sorts of different sorts of energy, and we can convert some of these into another. So here's a classic example of different sorts of energy. Here, what we're looking at is potential energy, and we're looking at kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy being converted into other sorts of energy. So let's explain what I'm talking about. So here we have a hydroelectric dam, and this dam has a whole bunch of water behind it that's higher up than the valley below. So that water has potential energy. If it falls, it will have kinetic energy. And that in fact is what happens in hydropower. The water's changing elevation, it's moving down. And as it moves down, it has kinetic energy. That kinetic energy gets transformed into electrical energy that then goes to power our society. But you might think about, well, what would happen if, let's say, the dam broke, which has happened in the past, not this particular dam? Well, what might happen? 
all of the water behind the dam might gain kinetic energy, it would start rushing down the valley. And instead of being transformed into kinetic energy, it would be transformed in different ways. It could be transformed by, for example, breaking off all the trees or moving dirt. And so we see this constant transformation of energy in the environment around us. So now I want you to think very quickly. I usually do this as kind of a little quizzy thing, but which activity requires the most energy and which requires the least? So I think you can guess that probably the least energy would be sleeping here. And the most energy would be mountain biking up a hill. So probably sleeping, sitting, walking, mountain biking. I don't know if this ever happens to you, but I know it happens to me all the time. And my kids always nag me about it. I'll be sitting on the couch working on something and it's really late at night and I get really tired and I start drifting off and my kids say, mom, why don't you go to bed? And I'll say something like, I'm too tired to go to bed. Now, how can that be true? I mean, right now I'm sitting, which we said was probably the number two lowest energy thing and going to bed, then I will be lying down. And when I'm lying down, I'll be lower energy and it will take less energy for me to be asleep. So how can I be too tired to go to bed? Well, the truth is that going to bed requires me to do something. I mean, it requires me to get off the couch and walk, which is higher energy, until I can get to my bed and lie down. Now, in the morning, I have the opposite problem. I'm lying in bed. I don't want to get out of bed because when I get out of bed, I have to stand up and then I have to walk. Even if I'm just going to go sit down in a chair at the breakfast table or something, which is fairly low energy, just sitting there in the chair. First, I have to get up and I have to walk and that's higher energy. So a lot of times when we're comparing energies, we talk about these, these pathways that we have to go through. Generally speaking, if you want to anthropomorphize things, we can say that atoms and molecules are lazy in that they're always looking to be in the lowest energy state. And to be at a lower energy state is to make an atom or a molecule more stable from an energy standpoint. So carbon by itself, you know, a single carbon atom is fairly high energy. If you think back to what we said, you know, it's high energy because it does not have that octet in its valence shell. Once it bonds with another atom and forms that octet, then it's more stable. It's at a lower energy state. So you can think about how energy changes when an atom changes from one state to another. So if you have a uh, carbon bonded with another atom and you're going to pull that carbon apart from the atom to be by itself, that requires an input of energy to go up the energy hill. You're, you have to go to a higher energy state. It's kind of like getting out of bed. And then if you want to go from being by itself to bonding with another atom, that releases energy. You're going down the energy hill. You're going basically from a high potential energy state to a low potential energy state. Um, and so that releases energy. So we're going to talk a lot in this chapter about state functions. And a state function is any function that doesn't depend on the overall path to get to wherever you're trying to get to. So I have this picture of a skyscraper here. This, of course, is the One World Trade Center. So I want you to consider something which requires more energy output on your part? Taking uh, the elevator to the top of One World Trade Center or walking up the stairs? Now, I think it's pretty obvious that the correct answer is 
walking up the stairs. I'm not sure how high it is to the top floor, but I know that the top of the cell tower is 1,776 feet. Um, so we're talking probably at least 1,500 feet to the top. And that's a lot of elevation gain. So we can look at those two paths to getting to the top and we can say, yeah, one of them definitely requires more energy than another. That's not a state function. But now let's consider something different. Instead of talking about energy, let's talk about altitude. We can think of two paths to the top, taking the elevator or walking the stairs. If you take those two paths, what will be your altitude at the end of each path? Well, it doesn't matter which path you take, it's always going to be the same altitude at the top of the building. In fact, you could, you know, get out your, your mountain climbing gear and climb up the side. That would be kind of awful actually, but you could do that, get to the top floor and you'd still be at the same altitude. You could get in a helicopter and go from the plaza below, you know, up and, you know, why stop there? You know, do circles around the cell tower and out over the harbor and everything, and then land down on the top floor. You're on the top floor, you're at the same altitude as everyone else who took the more conventional paths to get there. So altitude in this case is a state function. Everyone on the top floor is at the same altitude, no matter how wild and wacky the path that they took to get there. Now, obviously we're not gonna be climbing skyscrapers when we're talking about thermochemistry, uh, but let's talk about something like temperature. Temperature is a state function, okay? So here's this glass of water, and what I want you to do is I want you to stick a thermometer in the water and measure it. And let's just imagine that it's 25 Celsius. Okay, so what if I told you that before we measured this water, it was ice and I just left it on the counter and it gradually warmed from zero Celsius to 25 Celsius. Does that matter? Not really, right? It's still, I mean, who cares what it was an hour ago? It's 25 Celsius right now. I mean, in fact, we could have taken that ice and we could have microwaved it because we didn't want to drink ice. Uh, microwaved it all the way up to 90 Celsius because we weren't really paying attention. Took it out of the microwave, realized it was way too hot to drink. So we left it on the counter to cool down and now it's 25 Celsius. Does it matter that we went through all that? No, it's still 25 Celsius. So we're gonna be talking about a lot of state functions where it doesn't really matter how you get to the final answer, the important part is where are you now? Sometimes we'll talk about what's the difference between where you started and where you ended. So in this case, that would be going from zero to 25. And you can see here, I've shown you two different paths to get there. But the important thing is the overall change in the temperature was 25 Celsius. Okay, some more vocabulary. We're gonna talk a lot about systems and surroundings. People have trouble figuring out what is the system, and the answer is the system is whatever you want it to be. Whatever is most convenient for your experiment. You get to choose what is the system. And then the surroundings is everything around the system that can exchange energy with it. So for example, let's say here that this pot is full of water and we're heating the water to boiling. Okay, you may be interested in how fast the water gets to boiling and so you might say, the system is the water inside the pot. What are the surroundings? Anything that can exchange energy with the water. So that could be, for example, the pot. It could be the, the gas flame under the pot. It could be the rack that's holding the pot over the gas flame. It could be the air around the pot because as you know, if you're boiling water, if you put your hand close, but not on the pan, you could still feel the heat coming off of it. 
So all that would be the surroundings. You could also say, well, you can't heat up water without also heating the pot, so I'm interested in how much the pot and the water heats up. Well, great, now the pot and the water are your system. The surroundings are everything that can exchange energy with the pot and the water, so now we have the burner, the air, the rack, and you know anything else you might think of that I've forgotten. So again, you get to define the system for what is most convenient for you. And that's definitely going to be important when we talk about calorimetry. So one of the things that messes people up when we're talking about thermochemistry is signs, the signs of energy. The default is to think about things in terms of the system. So if you have a negative sign, that means something's leaving the system. And if you have a positive sign, that means something's entering the system. And yet people still get confused. So one thing that helps is to think about these exchanges in thermochemistry as an exchange of money. Okay. So let's say our system has a hundred dollar bill and that hundred dollar bill gets transferred to you. So the question then is, at the end of this exchange, is someone poorer? Now your first instinct is to say, no, look, I've got a hundred bucks. I've got a hundred bucks, I'm not poorer. Yeah, but where did that hundred bucks come from? It came from the system, right? The system gave you a hundred dollars. So the system has lost a hundred dollars. And you have to remember this, as an observer, you often think in terms of you, and this is why people get confused. You have to always put things in terms of the system. And you might think about something entering the system, right? That would be in our money case, money going into the system. Well, where's that money coming from? It's coming from you. The system is gaining hundred dollars because you are losing a hundred dollars. Normally when we're talking about chemical reactions, we don't talk about money. Um, we talk about heat and this is what confuses people. So when we have an exothermic reaction, a reaction where heat is leaving the system, that's going to be an amount of energy that has a negative sign. Heat is leaving the system, but we feel that and we say, oh, my hand is getting warmer. This is like you getting that hundred bucks. Yes, you have more heat in your hand when you feel that exothermic reaction happen in the beaker that you're holding. But where did that heat come from? That heat came from the system. The system is losing that energy. That's why it's exothermic. Because we think about these things in terms of what's happening with the system, not with us as the observer. When we have a positive amount of energy entering the system in terms of heat energy, it's what we call an endothermic reaction. Heat has to go into the system. Where does the heat come from? It comes from whatever is surrounding the system. It comes from those surroundings. And so if you're holding the beaker, some of that heat might be coming from you and you will start feel the system getting cold. This beaker is getting cold. It is losing heat. People's initial instinct is to say that should be a negative amount of heat, but it's not. The system is gaining heat. It's like taking that hundred dollars out of your hand, except here it's not a hundred dollars. It might be a hundred joules. So an exothermic reaction is like me not wanting to go to bed, even though it's a lower energy state. So we'll have our reactants at a higher energy state products at a lower energy state, we will get energy out, but a lot of times we need to give it a little bit of a bump. So for example, a propane grill or, you know, whatever you, you know, camp stove or something like that, that's an exothermic reaction. We definitely get heat out of it. It's why we use it to cook things, but that doesn't happen unless we first give it a little bit of a nudge, kind of like having to stand up and start walking before we can go to that lower energy state of bed. 
Um, and in this case, that would be, you know, either a match or your little electronic ignition spark or whatever you have on your grill. And hopefully your grill is not as exothermic as what's shown in this picture. An endothermic reaction, now you have your reactants at a lower energy level. You have to push them uphill and then you get your products. And again, there's that, that sort of walking, standing up kind of thing where, yes, we have to put in a little extra energy and then it comes down just a bit to where the products are. So up till now, we've been talking about um, kinetic energies and potential energies. But what we're going to do now is define a quantity that we call internal energy. Now, we are going to use E to represent this. But there are books that use U. So just FYI, if you go on to do PCAM, you might have a book that uses U for internal energy. I'm not sure why there is this disconnect. I think U is used more often by physicists and E more by chemists. But in any case, that's what we're talking about. So internal energy is basically any sort of energy that is found within a substance. And so it's all the kinetic energy and all the potential energy of everything. Now, the problem is it's really hard to look at an object like, you know, your chair and say, this chair has exactly 20.734 megajoules of internal energy. We can't usually do that. What we can do is we can measure how that internal energy changes as we do something to whatever our system is. So in the case of your chair, if you lift your chair up, you know there's more potential energy and you can actually calculate how much potential energy it has based on the height of the chair and the mass of the chair. So usually we're going to be looking at changes in internal energy and the change in internal energy is going to be whatever the final energy is minus the initial energy. So again, delta E, delta always means the change in. You're going to see a lot of deltas coming up. The change in internal energy is going to be the energy we end with minus the energy we started with. But I imagine you're thinking that, oh, hey, didn't you just say we can't calculate the amount of energy that we start with or the amount of energy at any given time, how do we calculate delta E? Well, usually we look at the ways that change in energy is expressed. And so it's going to be expressed in one of two ways, either as heat or as work. So the change in internal energy is going to be the amount of heat that was put into or that came out of the system plus the amount of work that came out of the system or was put into the system. For example, if you have a system that's losing heat to its surroundings, here it's losing 118 joules of heat, the surroundings are also doing work on the system, we can calculate the change in internal energy. Delta E is going to be, well, let's see. The system is losing heat, so that tells us that the amount of heat is going to be negative. But the amount of work, the surroundings are doing work on the system, that means they're putting energy into the system. So we're getting 97 joules of work. And so when you add that up, you can see we'll have minus 21 joules. What you see here is that even though the system is losing some energy and gaining some energy back, overall there is a net loss of energy. Here we have a different system and this is also losing and gaining energy. So it's absorbing heat, which tells us the heat is going into the system. So we have plus 419 joules of heat. Of heat. And the system is doing 157 joules of work. If the system is doing work, that means the system is using its own energy. It's losing its energy to get that work done. So 
Now we have 419 joules minus 157 joules, and you can see this is going to be net positive. Then it's putting, the system is absorbing more energy than it's putting out. So now we're coming to the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is very closely linked to the law of conservation of energy. So it basically says that the energy of the system and the energy of the surroundings is constant. It basically says that whatever energy comes out of the system is the energy that goes into the surroundings. So this is the mathematical form right here, delta E of the system equals minus delta E of the surroundings. So what comes out of one goes into the other or vice versa. And so I put a picture of someone golfing here. Um, you can imagine that as this person raises their golf club, there's a lot of potential energy in that golf club. The golf club comes down, the potential energy turns into kinetic energy, then the golf club stops. Where does that kinetic energy go? It goes into the golf ball. Okay, so that's gonna be the surroundings of the golf club. It goes in this picture, this guy's hitting up a lot of sand out of the sand trap. And so that's also part of the surroundings, right? The sand is around the golf club. So the energy is going out of the golf club into the ball and into the sand. Another really great example is your refrigerator. So your refrigerator is cold, hopefully. And not only that, the food that you put in there, it can be warm when you first put it in there, but it takes the heat out of the food. So it can start off warm and it loses that heat. It becomes cold. Where does that heat go? If you think of the refrigerator as the system that tells you that the heat it loses from the system has to go into the surroundings. So there's probably a place around your refrigerator that feels really warm. In this particular case, you can see down here, that's where the coils are. Um, that's where the hot air is going to be blowing out. The best place to be on a hot day is standing in front of an open refrigerator door. And the worst place to be is right next to the coils, wherever that hot air is blowing out, because it's always really hot where that hot air blows out. So as we go through and start talking about calorimetry, we're gonna to need to talk about types of systems. And I'm gonna talk about three different types of systems. An open system. An open system is one that can lose or gain both mass and energy. So for example, if I have a mug of hot tea, that can lose or gain, I guess, mass right, because I can pour hot water in or I can drink the tea out, so it could lose or gain, it's very easy. Um, it can also lose or gain energy because, you know, if you have your hot tea and you just let it sit on your desk and don't touch it for a while, it will not be hot anymore. A closed system can lose or gain energy, but not mass. So now it's no longer a mug, it's one of those travel mugs. So it's got a lid on it, okay? And as long as that lid is closed, it can't lose mass. The mug can't get knocked over and spilled. And you have to open the little um, flip top thing to be able to drink from it. Um, can it lose or gain energy? Well, yeah, those things are, at least mine isn't very well insulated. So it loses energy a little more slowly than my mug. Um, but it does lose energy. Now we also have isolated systems, what thermodynamicists call adiabatic systems. And these are systems that don't lose or gain either mass or energy. So now you have something that is sealed, so your tea can't get in or out. And it's also sealed from energy loss. So maybe this is a really, really good thermos um, that keeps things hot for an extremely long time. Well, a true adiabatic system would be, uh, would never cool down. And of course, we don't actually have very good adiabatic systems in this world, but we can, we can imagine what they would be like. As we get into this, we're gonna talk about work 
as a force acting over a distance. And most of the time when we're talking about um, chemical systems, that force is going to be what we call pressure volume work. So the classic example of this is your car engine, where there's basically gas being compressed in one of the pistons, right? Where this, the piston pushes down and the gas gets compressed. So here we have a force. You have to put energy in in order to compress the gas in the, in the cylinder. And it's moving over a distance, right? Because it's actually moving down. And so we calculate the amount of work that's done as pressure, the pressure you have to apply to squeeze it down times the change in volume. This is the sort of work that happens in chemical reactions. Now, sometimes we actually see this as a cylinder, you know, moving up and down, like with your car. And sometimes we see it as gas production. That's actually what we see a lot of in chemical reactions is the production of gases, which causes things to expand. So the system is pushing out. So energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's transformed from one form to another. It moves from a system to its surroundings or vice versa. These are the things that we have to keep in mind. Now, I know I've covered a lot of theory here. Next up, we're going to be talking about calorimetry and basically how we can calculate the amount of energy that's coming out of a chemical reaction, because that ends up being really, really important. I hope this was helpful and I look forward to seeing you again soon.